Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nidus Anarchy series. I'm your host, Adam. I'm the CIO of Nidus, and today we're going to talk about pass keys. What are they, and are they actually going to replace passwords? So, passwords suck. I think we all figured this out by now, right? Like, passwords are just the bane of, I think, everyone's existence. You can't remember them, they get hacked, you lose them, someone else steals them, you get fished, someone calls you up, social engineers it out of you. Forgot passwords, OTP, MFA, all this fun stuff, and it's just a pain in the butt. Everyone knows that if you have to deal with a password, it's going to be a problem at some point. And we're trying to move away from that. I mean, I've been touting forever about decentralized ID, self-sovereign ID, and what that means is, you know, you hold your identity and you just prove to someone else that you are without having to give them a password. How that all works is there's lots of other videos about that. But let's talk about pass keys, because pass keys, in my opinion, is kind of the interim step to decentralized auth, which to me is the final goal. So pass keys work with tech that we, we already know, we already use all the time. Uh, using public-private key. So if you're familiar with the public-private key pairs, it's pretty simple, right? So you generate a public-private key. So one is a public key and the public key has a private key. The private key, you keep private, you don't tell anyone, you store that away. The public key, you can give to everybody. So when you're using a pass key, what'll happen is, let's say you go to google.com. So you go to google.com and you're gonna log in with a pass key. Now what'll happen is, your browser or computer or phone or whatever will generate a pass key. What it's doing is it's generating a public and private key. It's gonna store them in a local database or a key store, and then it's going to give that public key to the application, so Google and this, this thing, or Gmail, let's just say, right? So now what happens is Gmail will store the public key there, which is totally fine. You can advertise your public key on a billboard if you want. It'll have no negative security consequences, well, not none, but for the most part, it really won't have any security negative impacts for you. The private key is where it's at. That's the part you don't want to share. So what happens is when you say, hey, I want to sign into Gmail the next time, it'll say, okay, here's a message you need to sign with your private key. So it gives you like a non some string text paragraph something. You take that private key and then you encrypt it, the, whatever the nonsense that they give you, and you send that result back to the website. Now they can use a different algorithm to verify that that public key that they have on file actually signed that message. So through cryptographic proof, they can prove that you have the private key without actually having to give them the private key. That's the important part. This is also a huge, no, I'm not gonna get to it right now, but this is a big thing in zero knowledge proofs. This is another huge step that we're gonna be taking a lot in the security realm. The basis of it is this. With the zero knowledge proof, it's saying, hey, I need you to prove something, but you don't have to give me the information. So I don't have any knowledge of what it is that you have, but I'm gonna prove it. So like a good example would be, hey, I need to know that you're over 21 years old, but I can't ask you your birth date because that's PII and I don't wanna hold on to it. So what do we do? Well, with zero knowledge proofs, you can say, hey, prove to me you're over 21 and I'm gonna give you some cryptographic proof that proves to you that I'm over 21 somehow. And you're gonna go, oh, okay, cool. I know you're over 21. I don't know what your birthday is, but you've proved to me cryptographically that you are over 21. This could be through driver's license, backends, and again, signing and public private keys, all kinds of fun stuff. So anyway, back to the pass keys. So these pass keys work like that. So we have the public key stored at Gmail. When we go to sign in, we sign the message with our private key and we send it to Gmail. And then Gmail says, okay, you've proven that you own that private key, which means you own that identity. I can now let you in. And this is also how Web3 wallets work, right? And it's public-private key pair, and then you're signing these nonces to allow access into whatever it is that you're trying to get into. So pass keys are nice because they let you do decentralized auth in a way because you own your own identity. The only downside is, for me, is that with pass keys is that you're generating a unique pass key for every single login for every single site. So that means if you log into 100 different websites, you're gonna have 100 different pass keys, which means you're gonna have to have 100 different private keys that you need to manage. Now, if you're a normal user, it's probably not the end of the world and not that big of a deal. If anything, it's probably a step up and it's quite nice in the sense that your phone or your MacBook or your whatever laptop you have, it will manage that all for you. The browser may even do it, you know, like kind of like a password manager, it will do it all under the scenes. So it's not like you have to remember these things. And a passkey is a crazy long string of letters and numbers in cases, you'll never remember it, right? So you don't have to worry about getting fished, which is great too. 
No one's going to call you up and say, hey, I need you to read me your private key. I think most people wouldn't even be able to figure out how to find the private key to let alone read it to them. So in that sense, a lot safer. Um, so but like I was saying, the downside is that you have to have one per website. You can't use one for all your websites or a series of websites. And that's kind of, I think, where the full decentralized model comes from. Um, also, you're fixed to that platform. So if you're an Apple person, because iOS just started recently supporting passkeys, which you probably started seeing on your phone recently, if you go into certain websites, they'll say, hey, do you want to log on with a passkey? You go through that method. Um, it's nice that it manages it all for you, but if all of a sudden I'm without my phone or I'm without my MacBook and I'm on someone else's computer or I'm flying somewhere and I'm just you know out and about and I need to log in somewhere and do something, well, without that passkey, I can't log in. Most websites are smart enough to have a fallback of either OTP where you can log in and text your phone, but again, don't have your phone, kind of screwed, or a username and password. But in that sense, it's the least common denominator. So it's nice and efficient for me to use a passkey, but if you're still storing a password, then that breach is still possible. Meaning if they're breached and their data sets ripped out, you know, all that stuff can be sold on the dark web, my password can be found out and then used everywhere. So even if you have all these really cool, crazy authentication steps, that are super secure, it always comes down to the weakest link. So if you're still using a username and password as a fail safe, that's still the weakest link. So the passkey is kind of irrelevant other than efficiency for the user. So when we come to security, it would have to be mandated that this is the only way, but then you have to have your phone, has to be the latest iOS, has to be you know, a computer that supports it with keychain management and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, now this is where like decentralized auth I think wins because with de like truly decentralized auth you can use whatever wallet you want you can import and export those keys to different wallet managers so I could have like my let's just say if I'm using my Ethereum wallets I could use MetaMask as my favorite personally I could dump it into a Coinbase wallet I could use uh, Phantom for all my Solana stuff I could even use Electrum I can use I can make my own wallet in a Lambda if I wanted to and run it as a microservice that does payments or authentications or whatever. So when it's truly decentralized, you have way more flexibility to do a lot more with it. But like I said, I still think we're a ways away before that's really adopted on the enterprise level just because it's so foreign. Now, pass keys, like I'm saying, is kind of like that middle step to get there because we're now using public-private keys for authentication. We're no longer using passwords, so now we've moved to passwordless. I own my identity, they don't have it, so now we're, we are decentralized in the sense that I own it, it's no longer owned by any corporation, I don't have to rely on them being available or I don't have to pay them a fee for anything, it's all on me. And because it's being adopted by like iOS and Google phones and Android and all this stuff, now it's usable. So to me, this is the next step of like how QR codes worked. So QR codes, when they came out, I was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be huge. QR codes are gonna be everywhere. This is so simple. It's the easiest way to transmit data just from a picture from your phone, but you always had to download an app. And that's what made it, that was like that barrier of, of really adoption uh, was that you had to have this third party app. People had to know what it was. And, and at that point in time, it was just like, you know, it really didn't pick up as much as it should have. But as soon as the phone manufacturers made it embedded into the camera, but as soon as you point with them when the link showed up, QR codes exploded. And that's what we were all waiting for. So I think pass keys are going to be something similar. So because it's just starting now and because it's now available on the phone, we're going to see this being adopted a lot more, kind of like web authentication where you can use face ID to log in and things like that. We're going to see this take off. And because of that, we're going to see a lot more enterprise adoption. So in the enterprise world, we're going to see a lot more use cases of pass keys coming up. So when we're talking about federation tools or authentication providers, like let's talk about you know, Okta, Ping Federate, and all these guys, next question is, do you support passkey authentication? And if they don't, it's going to be like, ooh, why not, right? So I, I guarantee you they're, they're already all over this if it's not already in there. And uh, this will be tied into your phone just as easily as it is now just to do any type of a biometric authentication with your phone. So I think this is great in the sense that it's moving us in the right direction towards truly decentralized authentication with full flexibility to actually own your keys. And it kind of gets everyone's feet, you know, in the water a little bit with using the public private keys and signing an encryption for authentication into various web applications. So I'm actually stoked about pass keys. I don't know how widely adopted it will be just because I think what will happen is as soon as the first person erases their, you know, their key store or they lose it or they something happens where they don't have access and then all of a sudden they're locked out of everything or they can't get back in or they can't figure it out. I think that's going to be some of the early hurdles, but we're just starting from, from an adoption stage. It's past keys have been out for, for a while, 
but from a mass adoption, it's just gonna start now because it's actually in the phone. So we're gonna see it adopt, I think, a lot faster. I think this is gonna be the beginning of that exponential curve for adoption rate of pass keys, so it's gonna be kind of cool to see. Um, but yeah, I, I, think it, I think it's a really cool tech, um, but yeah, I, I do think this is the beginning into decentralized auth. We're just gonna have to wait and see. But should you use pass keys? Yeah. If, if it's something that's available to you, I would definitely make that as an option. If not, at least anything, maybe as an MFA. So, hey, you still have your username and password because you have to for whatever reason, but you can use a pass key as an MFA or skip over it altogether and just say, hey, you can log and use a pass key or, but anything to get away from passwords, anything to just get us completely away from the entire horrible world of having to deal and manage with passwords, I think is gonna be a bonus for everybody. So, pass keys. I'm gonna say thumbs up, let's keep moving. If you have any questions about pass keys or wanna know how to integrate them into with your systems, hit us up. You can hit me up directly, adam at nidus.com. You can also follow us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, X, TikTok, all the fun things, we're all there. Come check us out. See you guys around, later.